All right, so we're three weeks in. We haven't reached the actual gospels yet. We're getting there. Slow progress, okay. So what have we, what have we talked about so far? We said first week, we created in the image of God. One of the things that that might mean is we're created how? If we're created in the image of God, what image are we created in? In, in what way are we created like God? Perfect. Well, the question is, like, we're not, we're not God, right? So we're not created as God. We're not exactly like him. But in some sense, he's made us in his image in a way that is like him. And so the question is, is what? And there's different, different ways of answering that question, I think. But one of the ways that I look at it is created to love, to love right? That God in his nature, God is love. That was First John. Yes? That as a trinity, the fact that there isn't just a single entity, God, that from before he ever created anyone, there was multiple, right? There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's relationship that exists within God. There's love that exists within God before anything else exists, yeah? And so God has a capacity for relationship and love in his nature. And I think that that is part of the in his image that he instilled in us. He made us relational, creatures that can have loving, trusting relationships with, with who? With him. Ultimately with him, right? Ultimately with God. That's what we were created for. He also created other people that we can also have those relationships with. But ultimately, our purpose was to be in intimate, close, perfect union relationship with God, yeah, okay. Now, what did Jesus call a relationship with God? Eternal life. eternal life. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you send. So if you're in a relationship with God, you have eternal life. Okay, so that's what we were created for. Relationship with God, eternal life. Then what happened? Then they ate the fruit. In the act of eating the fruit, what have they believed about God? That he lied to them, right? God said, if you eat this fruit, you're going to die. Satan comes along and says, you're not going to die. And Eve's like, oh, okay. <laughs> Satan must be telling me the truth, which means God must be lying. What happens to a relationship when you believe the other person is lying to you? Which does what to the relationship? Breaks it, right? You can't have a real, close, open relationship with somebody who's lying to you. And so that relationship is broken. If Adam and Eve's relationship with God is broken, what does that mean for their eternal life? Any worth playing? <laughs> there are more seats, so you can pull some around if you want. Yeah, so as soon as Adam and Eve's relationship with God is broken, their eternal life is lost. Yeah, they're no longer in eternal life. Okay. What else have they discovered by eating that fruit? What's wrong? <laughs> Just pull some of those chairs around where Georgia is. What was the question? I forgot. Oh, what else have they discovered by eating that fruit? One, they've said, I believe God is lying to me. So your relationship is broken. What else have they discovered? Yeah, and the, that was called... Okay. What was the what was the fruit called? Knowledge, knowledge of good and evil. Knowledge of good and evil. So they've discovered they have received knowledge of good and evil. And basically what we said that means, at least the way that I look at it, is they've they've discovered that there are things that are good and that there are things that are bad and that they have a choice of what they do. 
They don't have to do the good. They can choose to do the bad. But then the question is, well, what is good and what is bad? What defines it? What makes something good and something else bad? Do you remember? Yeah, essentially God in his nature defines good and bad in who he is. The things that God would do is good, right? If it's something that God would do, it's good. If it's something that God would not do, it's bad, bad. right? And what they discovered is they don't have to do what God would do. This is kind of like growing up, actually, isn't it? Your parents, like you grow up and you maybe think you just have to do whatever your parents tell you to do. And then as you grow up, you realize, I actually don't have to do everything that my parents, I can do what I want. You haven't got that old yet. You're still getting there. But what you also discover when you start doing what you want, is it doesn't always go that well. <laughs> hey. <laughs> yeah. So... Adam and Eve, they were created in this world where they were in this perfect relationship, complete trust in their creator, in God, and they implicitly did whatever he would do. I want to be like that. And in this moment, the whole world has changed because they are now no longer in that relationship with God and they've discovered that they don't have to do what he says. They can choose for themselves what they do. And the result is? Death. Death. As God said it would be. And that's pretty much where we finished last week with uh, James. So a bunch of places in the Bible says the same thing, but basically that sin leads to death. When desire has conceived temptation, it gives birth to sin. And when sin grows up, it brings forth death. Yeah? Before they ate the fruit, didn't they already have the option to disobey? They already had the option to they do evil things by lying. They didn't know that they did. That was essentially what they discovered in that process, right? Yeah, and started to put these other ideas. Actually, do you need to do? Is he even right? Is he even telling you the truth? Or is he keeping things from you? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so as I said, that's where we, where we finished off last week. Sin leads to death. Question is, what kind of death? And for me, there's kind of like three levels to this. The first kind of death that sin brings, I'm going to call practical death. So... Not like literal death, but uh, more metaphorical death. Pain, destruction, devastation in your lives. Your parents will have, they'll, they'll tell you to do things and they'll tell you not to do things. They'll tell you, can you please wash the dishes after dinner or pack the dishwasher or whatever, right? Or clean your room or get up at, on time go to bed on time. They'll tell you these things, right? To do things. And they'll tell you, don't do those things. Why? Why? Okay. Why? What? Uh, yeah. So that, so that what happens or what doesn't happen? Okay. Are they simply worried about like what food, what dishes they're going to eat off of tomorrow? Why do your parents tell you to do things and not to do other things? What are the rules there for? Protect them. 
They want to protect you. So that's either protecting you from doing things that are going to hurt you, that are going to make your life more difficult, or like teaching you to do those things that are going to make your life better and easier and you know more productive and better. But then the question is, well, why do they care whether your life is easier or harder? And the answer is, because they love you. Because they love you. It's exactly the same with God. When God's telling us, like, be like me, yeah? Do these things. Don't do those things. Because these are the things I would do, and those are things that I would not do. Be like me. He's not doing that to make our life more difficult or boring. It's exactly the same. He's doing it because he loves us. And he knows that when we go off and do our own thing, go our own way, it brings pain to us and to everybody around us, you know? And not just a little bit. Like, if you walk around the world with your eyes open, you will see how much pain there is in this world and how much of that is a consequence of people doing dumb stuff, doing what, whatever seems right in their own eyes, doing what they want rather than what God would want. So sin brings death everywhere. Well, it's kind of jumping ahead. I thought it'd be worth looking at some examples. So where might you go in the Bible to find like a list maybe of things that God says, don't do these things or do these things? Ten Commandments, okay. So these are the Ten Commandments. And I thought we'd look at the last, what is it, seven, uh, which are the ones that relate more to or deal more with how we relate to other people than how we relate to God. Because I think it's a bit easier to see the, like, the effects in our relationships with each other than maybe with our relationships with God. So the fourth commandment is the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day to set it apart as holy. For six days you may labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your cattle or the resident foreigner who is in your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart as holy. Okay, rest. One day a week, you need to rest. What is the practical consequence of breaking this commandment? Sorry? Tired. We're going to be tired. I think that the, like, the importance of this commandment is increasingly obvious in our world today where nobody keeps it. You know, when I was young, weekends were pretty much like, in fact, in South Africa, I'm pretty sure shops are still closed on Sundays. Uh, and the like weekend, uh, I think probably devices have been a big part of that. Like you just never switch off. You're always connected and you're always, your week just rolls on. But basically, everybody is exhausted all the time, physically exhausted mentally exhausted, emotionally exhausted, spiritually exhausted. Yeah? So the fact is, like, God created us. He knows that we need rest. He knows that we won't rest unless we're forced to. And so he commanded us, you must rest. Now, We talk about death. It's interesting, like I was told recently that with obesity and smoking, sleep deprivation, inadequate sleep, not sleeping enough, is like one of the biggest factors in terms of mortality. Like it literally shortens your life. How many of you sleep at least eight hours every night? Okay, so that's a very small minority. Yeah, me neither, although I'm older, but still. Okay, so one of the ways that lack of rest, lack of sleep leads to shortened lives is that people who are tired 
can't concentrate very well. Their attention's not very good. Your motor skills, you're literally less coordinated when you're tired. And so you're more likely to Crash your, car. crash your car, have accidents and kill yourself. <laughs> yeah. Say you're working in dangerous places, whatever. People, have, people who have less sleep are more likely to have accidents and kill themselves or hurt themselves badly. Not only that, you have all these different organ systems in your body that, that, have, that, that have processes that run in cycles. Apparently, all those different organ systems, those processes are synchronized by your sleep cycle. If you don't have a cycle, they're all messed up. They get all dysregulated and out of, out of whack, right? And so apparently that leads to all sorts of issues. It leads to weight gain, it leads to diabetes, or at least it's associated with weight gain, diabetes, cardiovascular problems, heart problems, arrhythmias, all these sorts of things. Impairs your immune system. If you're not getting enough sleep, so people have chronic inflammation, basically cells in your body are like chronically inflamed, which is very unhealthy and leads to all sorts of other problems. Autoimmune diseases, increased infections, neurodegenerative disorders, where your like various neurons start just degenerating, breaking down. Not, I, I googled. And then there's your brain. Your brain heals while you're sleeping. Your brain forms new pathways while you're sleeping, which is important for memory for, and for learning things. That happens while you sleep. If you're not sleeping, brain's not healing, you're not learning those new things. Also leads to, sorry? Well, if you're very, very sleep deprived, yes. Yeah, it'll like real problems, right? Um, but. But in any case, like mood disorders, depression, anxiety, all these things are uh, associated with in inadequate sleep. Point being, God knew what he was talking about when he said you need sleep, <laughs> you need rest, you know? Yeah. That's the one thing. I think the other thing that's really important for this having this day set aside in the week where you all distractions are put to one side is it gives you an opportunity to kind of reflect and to focus on those things that actually matter. And when day after day, it's just like this rat, what you call a rat race, it's just, you know, and you never have a chance where you're actually disconnected and you can sit and just rest and think and focus, as I said, like that's where your focus shifts back to God, you know? And if you haven't got that, it's not good. Well, I think it leads to being overwhelmed by there's Peter when he steps out in the water, and while he's looking at Jesus, he's walking on water, and then as soon as then he notices the wind and he notices these ginormous waves, and then he starts to sink, you know? There's lots of waves and winds in our lives, and we need opportunities where we can get our focus back on Jesus. Or we get distracted by all the, the other things in life, uh, and we become like the seeds that's sown among thorns, where worldly cares and the seductiveness of wealth and all the fun things and the games and whatever distract us, and the word that we receive from God achieves nothing. You read his word, but then immediately you're off onto the next reel and it's forgotten, you know? That's what that is. Yeah. So, Sabbath's important. Fifth commandment. <coughs> Honor your father and your mother that you may live long time in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Why would he have given that commandment? Why honor your parents? Because they made you. Because <laughs> they made you. And they're raising you. 
<laughs> that goes forever, pretty much. Sorry? And they're feeding you. They're feeding you. No What's their job? After making you. <laughs> Teaching you, protecting you, loving you. I like that, actually. I like that very much. This pretty much exactly follows, so I didn't have those. Teaching, protecting, loving. Really nice. So yes, one of their jobs is to teach you. Teach you what? How to live. Yeah, pretty much. They've made lots of mistakes in their lives. They've hopefully learned from some of them, which means they can share with you some of the wisdom that they've learned from their own mistakes so that hopefully you won't have to make the same one. Life has not changed that much. Technology, maybe. But like your parents actually know stuff that's useful to you. So that's one of the things. To teach you how to live a life that is going to be less painful and more productive than it would be if you had to make all the mistakes yourself. Protect you. In what way do they protect you? Giving you rules. So that? So you don't hurt yourself, yeah. A part of, part of, so I had a slightly different, like, while you're young and in their control, say, part of their job is to actually force you to do the things that are good for you and force you not to do the things that are bad for you until you're hopefully old enough to make those decisions for yourself. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many things your parents told you to do when you were growing up that were annoying. And then when you become an adult, you do those things by choice <laughs> because it actually is, makes sense. It's useful. Yeah, so that's one of the jobs. And there was this great, I heard this great story. Uh, does anybody know Con of Condoleezza Rice? Generation gap. She was, she's an amazing lady. She was, a, um, she was the Secretary of State for the US in the two, 2005 to 2009. But anyway, she's a very impressive lady. I was listening to an interview with her and she said, she was talking about how when she was young, she had to learn piano. And she learned, I think she learned until she was about 10 and then she kind of got tired of it and wanted to give up. And her mom said to her, you're not, you're not old enough or good enough to make that decision. When you're old enough and good enough, you can decide, you, you can make that decision for yourself, but uh, then, oh, well, sorry, Let's just read it. You're not old enough or good enough to make that decision. When you're old enough and good enough, then you can quit, but not now. And so she had to, she was forced to continue doing her piano lessons, and she ended up becoming like concert pianist level pianist. She's an amazing pianist. And she's like, now she's so grateful that she can play the piano. She loves it. I actually learned it until I was about 13 and gave up. And I wish I hadn't because I love listening to the piano. Uh, but she was able to make the decision to stop learning when she was good enough to actually appreciate what it's, what the value of learning piano. Anyway, so I kind of like that. And then the last thing is love. And I think part of that is like demonstrating God's love, right? Hopefully. We're in a broken world. And lot, we're all varying degrees of inadequate representations of God's love. But hopefully, um, your parents play that role as well. It's to teach you about God, teach you His Word, and to, to represent His love to you. Yeah, okay. Also, society is much nicer when people grow up learning to respect the people who are in charge yeah okay you shall not murder how does that bring death <laughs> that was fairly obvious should be you shall not murder in hebrew it is lo tirzach lo is no tirzach is tirzach is murder and it's no murder so it's pretty clear Right? 
And in Hebrew, there's a difference between killing. There's a different word, like English, there's a difference between the word kill and the word murder. This is specifically murder. It's killing where there's no legal moral justification. If you're doing it for yourself, pretty much. Okay. Adultery. You shall not commit adultery. How does that bring death? Actually, I'll go back here. Murder. <laughs> Not for the reasons. No. So, one way to look at this, the death that murder brings is obvious, right? It's killing a person. But we're talking more general. Pain and destruction in this world and in the lives of people. So, how does... I guess the question is, particularly if the person who dies is Christian, who really gets hurt? Yeah, it's, it, it's everybody left behind, right? So much pain. Yeah. Not killing. This, as we said, this does not. Uh, this is not a law against killing. It's a law against murder, which is different. The way that the way that I saw it was like legal. Are you? Are you do you have a legal justification for killing? There was capital punishment, right, in Israel. So if people had done particular things and they'd gone through a particular legal process to determine their guilt, death was a legally sanctified, say, outcome. What if you murder someone because they raped you? So the one is legal, and the other is moral. You're allowed to kill in self-defense, according to the Bible. But generally, in self-defense, the, the, the um, danger needs to be like... You're preventing something from happening, not revenge for something happening. Does that make sense? However... Under Jewish law, the society would kill them for doing that. But only after it went through the legal process that determined that they had actually done it, you know? And there were rules around... Mm, I don't know if you want to get... We can talk about it later. But it's interesting, the rules around that um, kind of protected women in those situations. And in that situation, again, there's a legal process. There were many, many Nazis that were executed after the war, after a court process. Um, and yeah, war is a different, again, a different situation. This is dealing with something quite specific. Uh, so it's already a crime. Yeah. For personal reasons, yeah. Um, I think... Yeah, okay. We'll leave that one. You shall not commit adultery. How does that bring pain and destruction? Who gets hurt? Your spouse. The other side? The betrayed? Absolutely. And?
yeah, I mean, if you have, if you've, if you have any, uh, if you've seen any of these situations, everybody's wrecked, right? A lot of pain to everybody as you're, you're right. right. Not just with the trade. Uh, and if there are kids involved, freaking families, it's just a big mess. Everybody, everybody around this situation is pain. Yeah. Okay. You shall not steal. How's that bring death? Or pain and destruction. Taking something from someone for yourself, the person that you're taking the stuff from doesn't have that thing anymore. And it might be very important of vital to them. Like the lungs are a food that they haven't taken. What about the warehouse the home store? Then the store goes out of business. You don't have a business. <laughs> <laughs> or the price of everything goes up. Everybody has to pay more because they're having to subsidize the stuff that's getting stolen. Yeah, basically, I mean, all sorts of things. Uh, for society, if you're living in a society that doesn't recognize personal property rights, that you can just take whatever you want from anybody, it's not a nice society to be in. If you're in a society that does, but nobody cares and everybody just takes whatever they want, it's very expensive and it's still not a very nice society to live in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's fine. that's fine. Like, like, obviously, degrees to these things. But generally, this is not something that's going to create a nice society to live in if everybody's taking whatever they want. Results in like, uh, well, if any of you, you like feel vulnerable and violated when people have broken in and taking your stuff particularly. This is something like in South Africa is a lot more common than here. It's horrible. Uh, anger, hatred towards the people who are stealing. Bad things. It's also not good for you. Like there's a great satisfaction in working for something and then receiving it versus just getting it, you know? So that's why Paul says to the Ephesians, the one who steals must steal no longer. Rather, go and work. Do good with your own hands. So that, well, it'll be good for you. You'll feel better about yourself because you're actually useful and you'll have something to share with other people, which is better. Okay. Lies. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. It's an interesting commandment. It's a bit more narrow than we tend to think. You mustn't give false testimony. What's a testimony? Story. Story? Okay. Where would you normally hear a testimony? In court. Yeah. This is normally something... Yeah, okay. That's a different testimony. <laughs> all right, all right. Normally this... And that is kind of the context here. Is like your neighbor, for example, has been accused of something or you accuse him of something, but maybe he's been accused and you say, yes, I saw him take that whatever when you didn't. You're lying about him, right? False testimony. But through the rest of the Bible, it's a lot broader. In Leviticus, God says, you must not steal... You must not tell lies and you must not deal falsely, like deceptively. Don't deceive your fellow citizen. In Psalms, it says, protect your tongue from evil and your lips from deceitful speech. Again, very broad. Psalm 101, this is something. God says, I will favor the honest people of the land and allow them to live with me. Those who walk in the way of integrity will attend me. They'll like, come and be around me and serve me. Deceitful people will not live in my palace and liars will not be welcome in my presence. Pretty sharp. And then in Colossians, Paul says, but now put off all such things as anger, rage, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, 
since you have put off the old man with its practices. And so anyway, through the Bible is pretty clear. No lying. Why? How does lying bring death? If it's found out, to who then? Who's hurt? Yeah. Yeah, so well, I mean in the case of the court, your lies about somebody else could be quite devastating for that person's life, right? But yes, more generally speaking, like when you're when you lie to somebody, if they find out it hurts, death to the relationship, right? Causes pain, destruction. Uh, even if they don't, even if they can't prove that you're lying, very often they suspect it, which is not much better because they still don't trust you anymore. And that's not like that sucks for them. It hurts to discover you can't trust somebody that you thought you could, somebody you care about. It also sucks for you. It's not nice knowing or even suspecting that people don't believe you, that people don't trust you. Um, and in the bigger picture, like when one lies, you're usually essentially trying to like twist reality to your own purposes. You're trying to change the world, to change reality, to get something that you want or to avoid something that you don't want. But the reality is most of the time that like twisted world collapses in on itself, you know? Your lies will be found out and that, that collapses, it hurts, it's painful. Even if it doesn't, trying to maintain this, like in my mind I've got, I don't know, some kind of movie, what would it be, what's that guy? Benedict Cumberbatch, who's he? Doctor Strange. I'm kind of imagining Doctor Strange, right? And he's trying to like keep this world in place that he's, you know, it's stressful. It's stressful trying to maintain all the lies that you're telling to try to keep this world the way that you want it to be. Does anybody know Judge Judy is? Yes. She's the best. She used to say, oh, back to there. <laughs> When people are like tripping over themselves trying to explain whatever story they're trying to tell her, she'd say to them, if you tell the truth, you don't have to have a good memory. Yeah. It's like, I don't remember. Yeah. Anyway, it's stressful. Try to remember all the lies you told. And if you don't, it all collapses in and it hurts. So anyway, personal experience. Don't do that. And, and like even for yourself, if you're telling, and I can speak from my own experience, if you're somebody who's, who's lying to the people around them, even if they don't know, you know. You know you're a liar, you know you're untrustworthy, and it makes you feel smaller. You know? It's not good for anybody. Death. Last one. Envy. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that belongs to your neighbor. What does covet mean? Want, pretty much. The word is chamad, and it means to desire or take pleasure in. I want it. Interestingly, 
in the whole Bible, we're now up to Exodus chapter 20. There's like 50 chapters in Genesis. So we're like a good way into the Bible. This is only the third time that the word's been used. The first time that it's used is in Genesis chapter 2, which is before Eve ate the apple, the fruit. And God, it says that God created every plant and fruit that was hamad, desirable to look at and good for food. So at that point, God has created this whole world and it says everything is available to you. You can desire it, hamad, right? Except for this one thing. But everything else you can have. And the next time that the word is used is in chapter 3. When Eve, oh, when Eve saw that fruit and she saw that it was hamad, desirable for making wise. And so the one thing she couldn't have, she desired, even though she could have everything else. And so she ate it. The next time the word is used is here in chapter 20. Now we covet everything. Yeah? House, wife, servants, cattle, donkeys, and everything else. Just, I think it's kind of interesting. Why is it bad to covet? Why does that bring death practical? To desire, to have envy, to want what other people have. Yeah. Um, because there are earthly treasures. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So there are things that yeah. So there are things that are not that important, but for some reason you really desire them. Why is it a problem to be envious of what other people have, of wanting what other people have? What and what does that produce in you? Hate, anger, dissatisfaction, theft, maybe. <laughs> can pretty much go through many of the other, other uh, commandments at that point. Adultery, theft, murder, ask David, King David. Envy is very, very dangerous. Causes a lot of death and destruction in this world. And something else that I, that I heard that's quite interesting is like, okay, so you have society, and for the last while our society has been quite stable. People mostly have followed the rules, mostly played the, played the game, everything runs. Apparently, something that is extremely uh, damaging or destructive to a society that causes it to collapse is not poverty. You can have very, very poor countries that every, it's still, everybody follows the rules, it's all stable, society works. It's relative inequality. It's differences. So everybody can be poor, that's fine. We're happy. But if some people are wealthy and other people are less wealthy, even if they're still way more wealthy than they would have been in poor, this is when the society falls apart. Flip the monopoly board upside down like, I don't care, right? Because that's envy. Yeah, it's very, very dangerous. So anyway. All this to say, when sin is full grown, brings forth a death. Pain, devastation, destruction everywhere. And that is why in uh, Proverbs, God, or more precisely wisdom, says, The one who finds me has found life and received favor from the Lord, but the one who sins against me brings harm to himself. All who hate me love death. as I said, I think is what we see in all those things. All those things that God's like, do this, don't do that. It's because it hurts. So that's the one kind of death that I think sin brings, but probably not like the most obvious. What's the most obvious death that sin brings? Literal, physical death. Yeah? You've probably all heard this quote. It is impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. 
Only two things that are sure in this world. You will die, and you'll have to pay taxes. <laughs> or, as the Bible puts it, man is destined to die once and then to face the judgment. Death. Everyone, every single person dies. Except maybe Elijah and Enoch, I think. Maybe two exceptions. At some point, everybody's body stops working. Either just time, old age, your body wears out, breaks apart, or gets destroyed by whatever, disease, accidents, other things. At some point, everybody dies. Death. But it's important to know that it was not always so. In the beginning, in the world as God created it for us to enjoy, it says, God said, I will give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the entire earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the animals of the earth and to every bird of the air and to all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has living breath in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. What does that mean? Everything was what? Not everything. What did they eat? Plants. Everything was apparently vegetarian in the world that God created, which means nothing died. Humans didn't die, not even animals died. Only plants. It's interesting. It wasn't until after the flood that God, when God like renews his like covenant, whatever, with Noah, that he says, okay, now you're allowed to eat animals. But prior to that, certainly humans were all vegetarian, and in the initial creation, even, even animals were. Now, it's kind of almost impossible for us to imagine what the world was like before the flood, even, but certainly before the fall, in the world as God cre initially created it. But I think that one of the ways we can get a picture of what God intended us to enjoy is by looking at what he intends for us to enjoy. Yeah? We don't necessarily understand very well what the look li world looked like before we sinned, but we do know what the, well, we have more of an idea of the world that God intends to give us once he's restored everything. And so in Isaiah 11, it says, A wolf will live together with a lamb. And a leopard will lie down with a young goat. An ox and a young lion will graze together as a small child leads them along. A cow and a bear will graze together. Their young will lie down together. A lion, like an ox, will eat straw. A baby will play over the hole of a snake. Over the nest of a serpent, an infant will put his hand. They will no longer injure or destroy on my entire royal mountain, earth. For the earth will be full of knowledge of the Lord, just as the water completely covers the sea. It's quite cool, right? Essentially what God is saying is that once creation is brought, brought into alignment with Him again, back into relationship with Him, there will be peace between man and also between animals, apparently, which is quite cool. And then in Revelation, it says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the residence of God is among human beings. He will live among them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will not exist anymore, or mourning, or crying, or pain. For the former things have ceased to exist, and the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making all things new. Then he said to me, Write it down, because these words are reliable and true. And so that is the world that God intends for us to inherit. And I think that's very much like the world that he intended us to enjoy in the beginning. It's one with no physical death and no practical death. One one in which we're completely aligned with each other and with God. But all that changed 
Uh oh. I'm gonna run out of time. All of that changed when? Yeah, when man rejected God, right? Decided that they didn't trust him anymore and decided to do whatever seemed right in their own eyes. Then death became a part of our reality, as it says in 1 Corinthians. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also came through a man. For just as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. And so, again, this death, physical, practical death, came through that decision that Adam and, and Eve made. Death of man. But in Romans, Paul expands things a little bit bigger. He suggests that creation itself died with Adam. That creation, that the world is dying, that it is decaying, that it is falling apart. He says, For creation eagerly waits for the revelation of the sons of God. Who are the sons of God? Yep. For the creation was subjected to futility. Does anybody know what futility means? What is futile? Any of you know? It's just futile. (laughs) Basically, it's pointless. It's useless. It's not achieving anything. It's pointless. So creation was made pointless, meaningless. Uh, powerless, not willingly, not because it wanted to be, but because God made it so. Why? In the hope that creation itself will also be set free from the bondage of decay into the glorious freedom of God's children. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers together until now. So apparently the entire universe is groaning and suffering. It's Chained, it's got this bondage of decay. What is decay? Falling, slowly falling apart. Right, okay. In science, we would call the bondage of decay. Does anybody know? In physics. Do you know? Second law of thermodynamics. Basically, so okay, your first law is energy cannot be created or destroyed, can only be changed, yeah? Second law is, over time, it always goes towards more useless energy. Heat. Correct. And so you basically, and, and in, in uh, so the term is entropy, it's a state of disorder. And so over time, all systems, unless somebody comes and interferes with it, will tend towards disorder. Unless you put energy in to bring it back up to a more ordered state. So, that's like rust. Yeah? Over time, things, cars will fall apart and rust. They'll stop working. Over time, your room becomes a mess. Unless you put energy into making it orderly again. Yeah? Every system in the world, unless something acts on it, tends towards this falling apart. That's the second law of thermodynamics, basically. And in terms of energy, what it's saying, basically the idea is that the universe is like a giant battery full of energy that was charged up at the beginning and it's slowly going flat. Technically, it's slowly, energy is being turned more and more into heat. And eventually, if it were left long enough, it would die. Heat death where the temperature all through the entire universe is the same and everything grinds to a halt. Now, one of the cool things about that, that discovery that this, of this law, the fact that the universe is 
running out of energy, basically, is it tells us that there had to have been a beginning to the universe. Which they didn't believe before that. They believed the universe was eternal. It's just always been here. But you can't be running out of energy forever. If we've been going flat forever, we would be flat, right? The fact that we're running out means if you go backwards, there must have been a start. And that's what told us that the universe actually had a beginning, which is what the Bible said, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is kind of cool. But anyway, that is what Paul's talking about when he says that the universe wants to be set free from its bondage of decay. It wants to stop falling apart and dying. Okay, we're going to have to start, stop there because my next question is, why? Why was it necessary for God to subject creation to futility, cause everything to decay and die, including us? Yeah. But we'll, we'll do that next week. Okay, let's pray. Not next week, maybe next week. Otherwise, in two weeks' time. Lord God, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the wisdom that you, uh, that you give us in it, Lord. That you, when you tell us these things that we should do and these things that we shouldn't do, these things that are in line with your character, in line with your nature, and those things that aren't, that you do those things, that you tell us those things because you love us. And I ask that you would help us more and more to, uh, as much as we can, choose in our life, Lord, to live in a to live it in a way that's glorifying to you, in a, to live it in a way that is in alignment with your nature and your character, Lord, and uh, that we would produce less death in this world through the decisions that we make. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.